This is the Kalam cosmological argument for God's existence. It uses the existence of the world to prove the existence of God, the creator of the world. The book of Romans says that the creation proves the creator. This particular argument is around 1,500 years old. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. So how do we know that everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence? Only nothing comes from nothing. And if the universe began to exist, then something must have created it. Imagine a cartoon or a movie where a wizard makes a rabbit magically appear out of nowhere. Got it? In this scenario, in your mind, the wizard's magic is an unseen cause of the rabbit. The rabbit didn't begin to exist literally without a cause. Do you really think that the rabbit could begin to exist with literally no cause at all? Whether it's rabbits or the entire universe, it cannot begin to exist for no reason at all. If things could begin to exist that way, then literally anything could begin to exist for no reason right now. Are you worried a unicorn will pop into being for no reason and start defiling your bedroom? If things can happen for no reason at all, then there literally can never be an explanation for why this unicorn doesn't appear all of the time. In fact, even if someone claims to see something pop into being without a cause, how do you know there was literally no cause at all? What if there was an unseen supernatural cause? More importantly, it seems clear that the ancient Greeks were right when they said, from nothing, nothing comes. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. And then there's this, the universe began to exist. Therefore, something caused the universe to begin to exist. So how do we even know the universe began to exist? Well, what if the universe has existed forever? Then it wouldn't need a cause because it never began to exist. I'm sure you've guessed the gist of where I'm going. The idea of a beginningless universe actually has big problems. If the universe has existed forever, then today is literally the day at the end of forever. In fact, every day of your life is the last day of an infinitely long string of days. But how can that be? Here's a hint. It can't be. It makes no sense, and the fact of the matter is that there was a beginning of time. The universe began to exist. Time is real. Teenagers sometimes tell me that time isn't real, though. I wonder if they'll hold their breaths underwater for five hours then. What? You don't want to do it? If time isn't real, then there's no difference between five seconds and five hours. Or are you saying time isn't real because you know that that means there's a God? Even if the entire world is some big illusion and you're living inside a computer simulation, you still experience time within your mind. You still think about one thing and then later you think about another thing. If there was no such thing as time, then nothing could ever change. But things obviously change. So how long could things have been changing? If the universe is infinitely old, then how many days passed before 10 days ago? Subtract all the days before 10 days ago from all the days before today. Well, it appears that infinity minus infinity equals 10. But how many days passed before 100 days ago? Well, it appears that infinity minus infinity equals 100. My friends, this makes no sense. You can't, you can't subtract the same number from the same number and get both 10 and 100. That's mathematically impossible. But this mathematical calculation would have to be possible if the universe is infinitely old. Therefore, the universe cannot be infinitely old or else the mathematical impossibilities would have to be possible. In fact, mathematical problems are worse. What, if, what happens if you, if you subtract out just the even number of days? Infinity minus infinity equals infinity. Or what if, you, what if you subtract out all of the days? Infinity minus infinity equals zero. And what if we wait for infinitely more days to add to today? The amount of days is still the same. Nothing was added. And this has happened an infinite number of times. Or perhaps you'll agree with me that the idea that the universe is infinitely old makes no sense at all. In mathematics, 
Infinity is a concept only. It can't exist in reality. In fact, math has rules that say you can't do subtraction with infinities. But if the universe is infinitely old, then there really are a set of days that passed before today, as well as 10 days ago. My friends, this cannot be. So we are left with this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist. Therefore, something created the universe. But what on earth could have done such a thing? Whatever it is, it literally started time. It can't be infinitely old or else we'd run into the same problems. It has to exist. And it has to exist beyond time somehow. Well, it's either a thing or a person. There are no other options. If it's a thing, similar to fire or water, then it causes events based on its properties. Fire burns things up not because it wants to, but because it has those inherent properties. And if the cause of the universe is merely a thing, then it would have timeless properties. Therefore, it would timelessly be causing the universe to eternally begin to exist forever. Since the universe has clearly aged past the point of beginning to exist, we are left with one option. The creator of the universe is a personal being that must exist, transcends time, and is immensely powerful. In this video, we will explain the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. It's called Kalam because much of the important work was done in the Islamic world of the Middle Ages. It's called cosmological because it uses the existence of the universe to show that God exists. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, 19-20, all people can know about God by observing what God has created. The syllogism of the argument is on the screen. A syllogism is like a general outline for an argument. Premise 1, whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. Premise 2, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. This is what is known as a valid syllogism. That means that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Once we have explained the argument, we will provide additional arguments to show that the cause of the universe must be an immensely powerful personal creator. This argument first began in the early Middle Ages in the Byzantine Empire under John Philoponus. The traditional Greek view of the universe came from Aristotle, who said that it was impossible for the world to ever have not existed. Christians saw that the Bible clearly teaches God created the universe, and so began actually providing good reasons for believing that the universe actually began to exist. Later, the Islamic philosopher Al-Ghazali worked with this argument and made it much stronger. But many were not persuaded, and the debate continued in the universities of Europe until Immanuel Kant argued that there was no solution. At that point, the end of the 1700s, philosophers dropped the argument. Over the course of the centuries, many debates about the fundamentals of how we know things raged. Things came to a head in the first half of the 20th century, and by 1950, some major progress was made. Thus, older ideas like Kant's ended up being refuted in the process, and so in the second half of the 20th century, the Kalam argument has come back to life with new, far stronger support. This argument will take effort to understand. It is not for the intellectually lazy. Remember that Satan was able to twist the Bible to tempt Jesus, but Jesus used careful reasoning to correctly interpret God's word, and God's Word tells us that we can understand and know God exists by studying His creation. This argument will not force anyone to believe in God. Imagine that someone told you there were a couple of full-grown elephants in the room with you. The evidence you have against the existence of those elephants is so obvious and strong that it's hard for you to believe in them. But is the world round or flat? The evidence for a round earth is also strong, but it isn't obvious. You have to give it a chance and think about it. This argument is like that. If you have a bad attitude, then you can easily ignore it. But if you want to know the truth, then you can be fully rationally justified in believing in God. Wisdom from God is good. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 2 Peter 1.5 tells us to make every effort to add knowledge to our faith, among other things. 
Proverbs one nine, uh, nine Proverbs nineteen one and two says, "The heavens declare the glory of God; the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech; night after night they reveal knowledge." So there's knowledge about God's glory that one can have by examining God's creation. What we will see with this argument is that these verses from thousands of years ago are both eloquent and accurate. The first premise of the Kalam argument states, everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. What do we have in support of this premise? First, it's a simple, basic intuition. It's like how you know that 3 plus 4 equals 7. You know it because you mentally observe the numbers and see that the answer must be 7. The ancient Greeks said that from nothing, nothing comes. Imagine a cartoon or a movie where a wizard makes a rabbit magically appear out of nowhere. Got it? In this scenario in your mind, the wizard's magic is an unseen cause of the rabbit. The rabbit didn't begin to exist literally without a cause. Do you really think that the rabbit could begin to exist with literally no cause at all? Whether it's rabbits or the entire universe, it cannot begin to exist for no reason at all. Philosopher John Ryland offers an additional argument in support of this premise. If things could begin to exist that way, then literally anything could begin to exist for no reason right now. Are you worried a unicorn will pop into being for no reason and start defiling your bedroom? If things can happen for no reason at all, then there literally can never be an explanation for why this unicorn doesn't appear all of the time. Please notice this point there cannot be an explanation. Let me add another argument to this list. For something to be able to exist, it is necessary that it be logically coherent. That means that it must have a definition. For example, a married bachelor is logically incoherent. But what about the old Greek question of the unstoppable force and the immovable object? Individually, there's nothing logically incoherent about them. And if things can pop into being out of nothing, then there's no reason why it must be only universes. In fact, there can never be a reason why it isn't anything at all. But an unstoppable force cannot meet an Im immovable object. That's as logically incoherent as the married bachelor or a square circle. One key to understand is that we know logically incoherent things cannot exist because we know they cannot be defined. They aren't things that can exist or not exist. Even if you can't trust what you see, you can know this through pure reasoning. But the unstoppable force and the immovable object are both logically coherent on their own. Therefore, they could emerge out of nothing. Remember Ryland's point. There can never be an explanation why anything and everything doesn't emerge out of nothing all of the time. It's literally impossible for there to be a reason why this doesn't happen all the time. And yet, the unstoppable force and the immovable object cannot meet because this is logically incoherent. Thus, the problem emerges. If things can begin to exist for no reason at all, then it must be possible for the force and the object to meet. But they cannot meet. Therefore, things cannot begin to exist out of nothing without a cause. No matter how much you study or what schools you graduated from, 3 plus 4 makes 7 equals 7. The key to understand is that we don't even know if things like numbers actually exist, but we do know 3 plus 4 equals 7, and we know that reality must conform to mathematical rules. Let's say that you put three gold watches in a box. Wait a year and check on the box. Let's say that you find four gold watches in the box. What will you conclude? You might say that you forgot how many you put in, or perhaps you tamp someone tampered with your box. What you will never conclude is that the number three equals the number four. But why not? That would explain your observations perfectly. Just say that there's simply no difference between 3 and 4. You'd be willing to say that gold watches can somehow make babies before you'd agree that 3 equals 4. Whether numbers exist is uncertain, but what is certain is that any world that exists must conform to mathematical rules. Saying that 3 equals 4 itself is logically incoherent. It's not possible because it's not definable. It's not really a thing that can be possible or impossible. It's meaningless gibberish. Whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. In fact, even if someone claims to see something pop into being without a cause, how do you know there was literally no cause? 
What if there was an unseen supernatural cause? Your answer must be philosophical, not scientific. Science deals in observations. But how do we know we can trust observations? Because this question is so important, we must pause at some length to deal with it. Philosophers often must deal with brain-in-the-vat scenarios. What if aliens from the nearest star to our sun captured you and hooked your brain to a machine that fed you realistic simulations of an exterior world? In this case, nothing you see is actually real. We must conclude that this is actually possible, so should we trust that anything we see is real? To answer this question, let's use a classic example from epistemology. You are walking down a road. You look out into a field and see a sheep. On the basis of seeing the sheep, you conclude that a sheep actually exists where you see it. Let's say that Farmer Bob walks up to you. You know Farmer Bob to be an honest and reliable man who knows his fields well. He tells you that he has a sheepdog, which at a distance is indistinguishable from a sheep. Now you have what epistemologists call an undercutting defeater for your justification for belief in the sheep. But what if Farmer Bob never came up to you? Should you doubt the existence of the sheep just because it's possible that Farmer Bob could come up to you? You see the sheep. But what about this possible defeater called Farmer Bob? The issue is that for every possible defeater we can imagine, we can also dream up a defeater defeater. It's possible that right after Farmer Bob comes up to you, his wife comes and tells you that he's recently suffered brain damage from a disease or injury. We can dream up an infinity of defeaters and defeater defeaters and defeater defeater defeaters, etc. In terms of rational justification for belief, this infinitude of defeaters cancel each other out. We have to give more weight to the fact that we see the sheep. Thus, in the absence of any good defeaters, you should simply trust your eyesight. To help us understand this point, let's attempt to challenge it. A friend of mine works as a scientist. One of his co-workers told him that there's more evidence that we should not trust our senses than that we should. Since we can't question the woman for details about her view, we will have to guess what she meant specifically. She could be saying that she knows we can't trust our senses because of her evidence. This is self-contradictory and cannot be true. Her evidence is, is itself based on sensory observations. Or perhaps her view is that our sensory observations very often yield conflicting and contradictory information. So the inconsistency, if it exists, would actually be a defeater. Specifically, you are rationally justified in trusting your senses unless you have an actual defeater. Possible defeaters are not enough. But this woman supposedly has more evidence against the reliability of observation than there is for it. So if her argument is based on this inconsistency, I respond by saying that I simply doubt that she actually has this evidence. For example, when the stoplight turns red, everyone normally stops. That's consistency. Or what about the overall progress of science? How could this happen if our observations were inconsistent? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps she could add that there is a fishbowl problem at work. In epistemology, the fishbowl idea is that our sensory knowledge is distorted and gives us false information. But it is all distorted in the same way, like how we must look strange to fish in a bowl. Of course, now she would be retreating into possible defeaters. Here she's in trouble. We could e easily propose that another fishbowl exists that corrects the distortion of the first. And we could go back and forth with her like this an infinite number of times. And what we're left with is that when you look out and see something, it's really there unless you have a good reason to think it isn't there. And she doesn't have anything of the sort to defeat sensory observations in general. Excuse me. While I go clean my glasses. Science always uses observation as proof for its conclusions. We know things are true in science because we see or hear them. 
We may use tools to our, augment our senses, but ultimately it goes back to observations. Science cannot justify whether we can trust our observations. That's a philosophical question for which we have given a philosophical answer. And the conclusions of science can never be stronger than the foundations upon which they rest. If someone tells you that there is a mountain of scientific evidence for distrusting all human observations, they are failing to see the point entirely. The scientific evidence against observations is itself founded on observations. This evidence would be really, would really just be a defeater that is outweighed by a great deal of evidence. It's literally outweighed by all the time science has worked and progressed forward. Of course, if she proposes that some sort of unthings, unseen thing distorts our observations and makes us only think that only think that science has progressed, now we're talking about a possible defeater again. So it is key to understand this point. Again, this is key. The strongest justification for the premise, everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence, is philosophical in nature. We're not simply saying this is true because we've never observed anything else so far. We could say that. But the idea of something beginning literally for no reason at all makes no sense. Imagine that our universe began to exist for no reason and that it has properties such that nothing can begin to exist without a cause within it. In this scenario, the universe is really just the immovable object, and any bunny rabbits that begin causelessly within it are the unstoppable force. Furthermore, imagine that the bunny rabbit which begins to exist causelessly has special universe rule altering properties. Furthermore, imagine that a second bunny rabbit emerges from nothing that has special properties to alter the nature of the universe back. There can never be an explanation for why this doesn't happen all of the time. In fact, there can never be an explanation of why this doesn't happen with infinite speed so that the universe gets altered an infinite number of times per second. At this stage, I think it's best to leave this to you to ponder. Alvin Plantinga defines philosophy as thinking really hard about something. If you've made it this far, then by all means, go philosophize some on your own. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. If the universe did not begin to exist, then how old is the universe? Without any beginning, starting point, or birthday, the universe would literally be infinitely old. And this is impossible for more than one reason. Let's hypothetically say that Jupiter and Earth have been orbiting the Sun for an infinite number of days. Let's also say that Jupiter orbits the Sun at one half the speed of Earth. How many orbits have both Earth and Jupiter completed? Earth must have completed twice as many as Jupiter, but because they have been orbiting for infinite time, they must have both completed the same number of orbits, which is infinity. This situation is mathematically impossible. No matter how much you study or what school you graduated from, 3 plus 4 equals 7. The key to understand is that we don't even know things like numbers actually exist. But we do know 3 plus 4 equals 7, and we know that reality must conform to mathematical rules. Let's say you put three gold watches in a box. Wait a year and check on the box. Let's say that you find four gold watches in the box. What will you conclude? You might say that you forgot how many you put in. Or perhaps someone tampered with your box. What you will never conclude is that the number three equals the number four. But why not? That would explain your observations perfectly. Let's just say that there's simply no difference between three and four. You'd be willing to say that gold watches can somehow make babies before you'd agree that three equals four. Whether numbers exist is uncertain, but what is certain is that any world that exists must conform to mathematical rules. Saying that three equals four is itself logically incoherent. It's not possible because it's not definable. It's not really a thing that can be possible or impossible. It's meaningless gibberish. Logical impossibility means that something cannot exist because it is not definable. An infinitely old universe is not logically impossible. It's metaphysically impossible. There's nothing logically impossible about the universe being infinitely, infinitely old. But if it was infinitely old, then logically impossible violations of mathematical rules would have to be possible. It would have to be possible for this situation of Jupiter's and Earth's orbits to actually exist. But it cannot exist because it's meaningless. Thus, it is not possible that the universe is infinitely old. 
It is not a logical impossibility, but a metaphysical one. It's a problem of existence, not logic. One way around this problem is to propose that the universe neither began to exist, nor is it infinitely old. One could propose that time doesn't exist, and that the universe exists in a static state. For some, this may seem like a powerful way to defeat the Kalam cosmological argument, but proposing that time doesn't exist is far crazier than simply saying you learn magical spells in the mystical mountains that defeated the Kalam. If time doesn't exist, then nothing ever changes. For anything at all to ever change, then the situation must be one in which an earlier state is different than a later state. The evidence you have that things change is incredibly strong. It is simply irrational to reject the existence of time on the basis of a mere possibility. We currently do not have any evidence that time does not, doesn't exist. The theory of relati relativity has dual interpretations on this matter. One interpretation says that while time is ticking along for the universe as a whole, it slows down for you the faster you go. The other interpretation says that there is no time for the universe overall and time slows down for you the faster you go relative to the time for some other object that is not moving with you. But for time to be speeding up or slowing down at all, it still exists for you. And as long as time is real, even if only for you, it is still real. It doesn't matter if time doesn't exist overall for the entirety of, the, of existence. All that matters is that your world is one that changes. Time had a beginning somewhere in the past for you. As we will see later in this argument, whatever set time off is what must be God. The evidence for time is purely, even purely mental. Regardless of whether the world you see with your eyes is an illusion, you experience time mentally whenever you change what you're thinking about. Time is real. One of my favorite ways to illustrate this is by thinking about swimming. Will you stay underwater and hold your breath for five hours? If time is an illusion, then there is literally no difference between five seconds and five hours. That difference in amount of time would be a difference in amounts of nothing at all. Why even waste money on a wristwatch? Why wait for the road to clear before you pull, pull out onto it? And why bother remembering anything when there's no such thing as the past? A beginningless universe has more metaphysical impossibilities that we have to talk about. If the universe has existed forever, then today is literally the day at the end of forever. In fact, every day of your life is the last day of an infinitely long string of days. But how can that be? Here, here's a hint. It can't be. If the universe is infinitely old, then how many days passed before 10 days ago? Subtract all the days before 10 days ago from all the days before today. Well, it appears that infinity minus infinity equals 10. But how many passed before 100 days ago? Well, it appears that infinity minus infinity equals 100. My friends, this makes no sense. You can't subtract the same number from the same number and get both 100 and 10. That's mathematically impossible. But this mathematical calculation would have to be possible if the universe is infinitely old. There would have to be a real amount of days before 10 days ago and also a real amount before 100 days ago. Therefore, the universe cannot be infinitely old or else the mathematical impossibilities would have to be possible. In fact, the mathematical problems are worse. What happens if you subtract out just the even numbered days? Infinity minus infinity equals infinity. Or what if you subtract out all of the days? Infinity minus infinity equals zero. If the universe was infinitely old, then someone could have built an infinitely large hotel, and the hotel could be full, and an infinitely large bus could have shown up, and you can subtract, in, and if you can subtract infinity from infinity and still get infinity, then you could reverse the process and completely, and the completely filled hotel could have room for an infinite amount of infinitely large buses. Furthermore, if all the people in the even-numbered rooms that checked out, it, it, Furthermore, if all of the people in the even-numbered rooms checked out, you could fill all of them with people from the odd-numbered rooms. That's because the amount of people in the odd-numbered rooms and all of the rooms is the same. But, but if all of the people in all the rooms checked out, then the hotel would suddenly be empty, and if the universe is infinitely old, then there's more than enough time for all of these things to take place. And what if we wait for infinitely more days to add to the day? The amount of days is still the same, nothing was added, and this has already happened an infinite number of times. Or perhaps you'll agree with me that the idea that the universe is infinitely old 
makes no sense at all. In mathematics, infinity is a concept only. It can't exist in reality. In fact, math has rules that just say you can't do subtraction with infinities. But if the universe is infinitely old, then there really are a set of days that pass before today as well as 10 days ago. My friends, this cannot be. So we are left with this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist. The cause of the universe must be either an impersonal thing or a personal being. Whatever it is, it cannot be infinitely old. If it was, then all of our old problems come back. And it cannot begin to exist. If it did, then something caused it to exist. And something caused that thing to exist. And this chain of causes was either stretched back to an infinite past or else there is a first cause. Since an infinite past is impossible, there is a first cause that is not infinitely old. And it could not have popped into being from nothing. So all we are left with is something that exists outside of the normal relationship to time. While it is clear that time exists for you and me, it cannot be the same for the cause of the universe. This means that the cause of the universe does not change. When causing the universe to begin to exist, it would have to be a personal being. Impersonal things function as causes based on their properties. Fire burns you not because it chooses to, but because of its inherent properties. If the cause of the universe is an impersonal thing, then the effects caused by its timeless properties would themselves be timeless. The universe would timelessly be beginning to exist. Since the universe is clearly older than that, the cause of the universe is a personal being. This being created the universe. It's not possible for this being to either come into existence or stop existing because that would be a change. The creation of the universe would not be a cause that comes before the effect. It's not like a wind that blows and then the door opens. It's like a chandelier that's held up by a chain. The chandelier staying aloft is caused by the chain, not before, but at the same time that it stays aloft. Because this is a personal being, the creation of the universe is something it wanted to do. Therefore, it has a plan and a purpose in creating the world. Because this being doesn't have our normal relationship to time, it would literally know the future. It would see all events before they occur because for God, all time is present. This being would l not really take any time to do anything or learn anything. God would already know everything even the future of your life. Many of the attributes of God which are taught in the Bible would have to be true. God created everything that exists. John 1, 1 through 3. God knows the future. God was created and simply exists. God, God, God was not created and simply exists. God wanted. Uh, God has a plan for your life. We cannot prove the entire Orthodox Christian teaching from this argument. We can't even show that this God is good. But when coupled with the moral argument, we can show that this God, this is a this God is a good being that loves us. In fact, God is love, as 1 John 4 says. God will be a righteous, powerful being who takes sin very seriously. God created the universe and knows literally everything. God cannot come into being or go out of being. God's non existence is literally impossible. And since the orthodox doctrine of Jesus being our Savior cannot be proved from the moral argument or any philosophical reasoning, and still the orthodox doctrine of Jesus being our Savior cannot be proved from the moral argument or any philosophical reason, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that proves Christianity true. And we can know Jesus is alive. It's a revealed doctrine that relies on the trustworthiness of the witnesses to his resurrection. Fortunately, their credibility is more than enough, but that's a discussion for another time.